afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Janet Denhart. Did you have a good lunch? Good. Well, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a professor at University of Southern California. And if this were a class, I would make you all move to the front. But since it's not, you can all stay where you are. Um, I, I understand. Today I'm going to be um, talking with you about the topic of organizational resilience. Um, but before I get started here, I want you to note that I'm from the University of Southern California, um, and I'm at the Price School of Public Policy in Sacramento. I want to make a note of that because there will be a little pop quiz at the end about where I'm from, okay? So I started to, um, studying resilience a few years back because I really felt like we needed to think of a new way to approach organizational change. You've heard over and over and over again that change is inevitable. All organizations are buffeted by all kinds of forces, whether they be political, socioeconomic, uh, demographic, uh, environmental um, kinds of forces that cause our organizations to have to react and to change over time. And traditionally what we've talked about is that we need to plan and manage change, right? We need to overcome resistance to change. We need to get past all of those people who don't want to change. <laughs> well, the problem with that is that change isn't a one-time occurrence. It's not like you build up to this big change, you make the change, and then you're done. Whew. Um, change is, happens over time, it happens repeatedly. And so I'm going to get right to the first point of my presentation, and that is rather than thinking about managing change, what we need to begin to think about is that organizations need resilience or the ability to bounce back repeatedly as challenges occur over time. Resilience is a word that is, is used a lot now. It, it actually wasn't used very much when I first started writing about it. But resilience has become a very, very popular word. And generally, the word is used to talk about recovery, um, how you recover from a natural disaster, how you recover from um, an epidemic. But we're going to talk about resilience a little bit differently. We're going to talk about resilience as the ability of an organization to bounce back from problems in a way that makes them better able to meet the challenges of the next problem. So the first main point is organizations need resilience. The second main point is don't wait for the disaster to occur. Um, when things are moving along swimmingly, the temptation is to not worry about change. You know, thank goodness we have a little lull here. We're all doing fine. Resilience is an everyday issue. And it has to be practiced over time because if you wait for the crisis, it's too late. Um, if you haven't practiced the resilient response um, over time and gotten your organization used to it, um, if you do survive the challenge, if you do solve the problem, you're likely to, to end up with an organization that is less flexible and more brittle and less able to adapt going into the future. So here's the lie we have to all get over. We need to get over the idea that we can see into the future and that the future is based on the past. We love to go to conferences and hear futurists. Why? Because they tell us what's going to happen. And the future is, the unknown future is, is a little bit frightening. But the truth is you can't rationally plan for all future challenges. And in fact, I would ask you, how many of you are facing the, the largest and most troubling organizational challenges that you're facing today? Are they ones that you had a plan for? Was there a strategy in place and all you had to do is go pull it off the bookshelf and there you go? No, no probably not. Because you can't plan for unanticipated problems. If there are things you can plan for, by all means, plan for them. If there are things you can predict, then 
that's terrific, and we should try to predict as much as we can. But the truth is that our organizations and our environment are changing so rapidly that we will not be able to rationally plan for unanticipated events. So let's talk a little bit about um, the idea of resilience. I said it's a word that's used a lot. Um, if you go back and look at the origins of the word, and that's what professors do, they always go back and look at the origins. Um, it, resilience was first used in material sciences and engineering. It was actually uh, the property of a physical object that would allow that object to be stressed and then return to its original shape. So you can see there, I don't know if you can really tell on this slide, but when you bounce a ball, the bottom of the ball flattens. And then as it returns to its shape, that's what makes it bounce up. So they used this kind of engineering in those um, five mile an hour bumpers, which are a lie. Um, I, I have dented mine at three. Um, <laughs> Uh, things like tennis rackets and weather stripping around doors, the idea is that you can stress it and it'll, and it'll come back. The thing to note here is that over time, repeated use actually weakens the resilience of engineered re uh, resilience of, of the object itself. Eventually the ball will go flat, the tennis racket won't have the same um, effectiveness, and the weather stripping will give up. The second way that resilience has been used is to, um, it was originally used in psychology to study children. And what they found was that there was a certain group of children who despite great adversity turned out better than anyone expected. And when they looked at these children, what they found was that they had certain, certain characteristics. One, they were, they were good with people. They had very, very high levels of social competence. They were good problem solvers. They had a good sense of right and wrong. Um, and I, I, I can hypothesize that uh, when, a, when a kid knows that what's happening to them is wrong, they're, they're much be, uh, better able to cope with whatever is happening as opposed to thinking, well, it's, it's my fault. And they also had good senses of humor. And these kids who had these characteristics did much, much better than um, other children who did not have these characteristics. The third and newer use of the term of resilience is ecological re resilience, and that refers uh, to the ability of a natural system to adapt over time um, in a way that leads to sustainability, which is another word we hear about all the time. The system can change very slowly or it can change very rapidly, but the key with an ecological resilience is that human intervention generally does damage. Mother Nature does not like when you mess with it. Um, and so what we've learned is that um, natural systems actually do better if we let them operate on their own without human interference. And that when we try to change them, we should try to change them in small ways and to see what the, the reaction of the system is because it's so complex. Now you'll note here that the purposes of each kind of resilience are a little bit different. Um, in engineering resilience, you want to return the rubber ball to the, to the original round shape. In psychological resilience, you want to survive in the face of adversity. And in ecological resilience, the goal is to move to a new stable state where the various um, components of the ecological system um, begin to balance out and, and it moves to a new, a new state. What we want in organizations is a little bit different. What we want in organizations is the ability to use change not just to survive, but to make the organization more adaptive and more flexible and better able to cope with changes um, that occur in the future. So challenges and changes make the organization better, which makes organization resilience a little bit different. And the reason that organizational resilience is different than rubber balls children and, and ecosystems is that they're not physical properties. They are not individual. It's not an individual phenomenon. It's not the resilience of a single individual. And it's not an ecosystem. And the, and the main thing that we need to remember about organizations and therefore organizational resilience is that we make up organizations. We, they don't exist unless we intervene. They don't change unless we intervene. 
So they're systems, but they're not natural systems. So these different kinds of, of, um, of resilience are useful to begin to look at organizational resilience, but organizations, are, as I said, are not rubber balls, they're not children, and they're not um, environmental systems. Having said that, I think it's fair then to conclude that you probably cannot engineer a perfect organization and throw it up against the wall repeatedly until the ball runs out of air. You can't do that. There's no such thing as a perfect organization that you can stress and stress and stress and stress and stress and have it continue to, to bounce back to its original shape. And an organization that's resilient is not just a collection of resilient individuals. If you think about it, if you have a highly dysfunctional organization, having a collection of highly res resilient individuals may mean that they all withdraw because that's what's resilient for them as individuals psychologically. But what you want is an organization that's resilient. And it's not an ecosystem because we can't leave it, our organizations to mother nature. That would be bad. So organizations are different and organizational resilience has to be um, instilled and built over time consciously and um, it has to be practiced uh, with, with with discipline and with, with uh, consciousness about what you're doing. So here is a, an academic definition of what we're talking about. Uh, sometimes I think that academics uh, assume that they're getting paid by the word. Um, but let's, let's just read it for a second. So organizational resilience requires innovation with respect to those organizational values, processes, and behaviors that systematically favor perpetuation over innovation. The goal is an organization that is con constantly making its future rather defending its past. I personally think that this is simpler. What you wanna do is not just bounce back, you wanna bounce back in better shape than you were. So, with all apologies to Hamill and Bill Gangas, bounce back better, I think actually sums up what they say. So resilient organizations look, feel, sound um, different than other kinds of organizations and they have um, a number of different characteristics. The first is competence. You can't have a resilient organization without competent people that know how to do their jobs, that are up to date on their training, that are skilled in the areas that they need to be skilled in, and that they're kept up to date um, with, with new processes, new technologies, um, and so forth. S second thing is there's a level of commitment to common goals. In other words, what you hear people talking about is not just what's best for me, but talking about the good of the organization. The third thing is coordination. In a lot of organizations, I know what I do in my division, but I don't know what that division over there does. And that makes coordination very difficult. We talk a lot about silos and all of that, that sort of thing. But a lot of it is just information and making sure that people are exposed to the work of people in other areas of the organization. Communication, you have to make sure that information is widely shared, that um, when something happens, you know that the information will be passed along in an effective and accurate way. And finally, connections. In resilient organizations, you walk into a resilient organization and people are talking. People are smiling and they're laughing with each other. There are relationships built into that formal structure so that when I have something that, that comes up at three in the afternoon, I don't have to go to my organizational chart and say, hmm, who does this? You can just say, well, I'll call Susan. Susan will know what to do. So these relationships are built and nurtured over time and supported by the organization. So how do we get from where we are to where we wanna go? I'm gonna talk about three pretty simple things that you can do to build um, resilience over time. Uh, we're gonna talk about practice. We're going to talk about improvisation and building a repertoire. And we're gonna talk about the issue of control.
we're familiar with the notion of practice in athletics, right? So you see this guy down here. I don't know what that is, actually. It's some sort of, what is it? It's a skateboard, but he looks like he's going faster than normal because he's got the, you know, he's, it's like he's almost doing a bobsled kind of thing. Now, he needs, obviously, to practice before he goes 100 miles an hour on the skateboard. And we are familiar with that. We know that in order to build the capacity to do that, um, you have to practice over time and build skills. But if you look at these other pictures, what you also see is that teams need to practice together. You wouldn't take a group of newly graduated medical interns and say, OK, surgery starts in 10 minutes. Because although they each may have particular skills, they're not used to working together, and they're not used to working together to respond to unanticipated things that might happen in the operating room. Um, sports teams also may have highly skilled players, but they need to practice together. And what you want to do is you want to practice with just manageable threats. Why do you want to do that? So that you have success. Because resilience builds on resilience, which makes you more resilient. And so when you're presented with threats that you think that your organization can handle, use it as an opportunity to practice the resilient response. So what you want to do is not just solve the problem, but what you want to do is you want to approach and solve the problem in a way that leaves people feeling confident about their ability to handle change, trusting each other, and flexible for the future. Like, we can do this. We can handle the unexpected. We can do this. You want to build um, trust, competence, and you want to practice respect for people in this process so that they learn to not be so f afraid of change. And as people work together over time, they get better and better at it. A lot of what you do um, when you're going through an organizational change is actually improvisation. And we, we talk about um, uh, comedians that improvise. We talk about jazz musicians that improvise. But executives and leaders and, and managers improvise all the time. When you look at comics or musicians, you may think that they're just making stuff up. Stuff, right? They're not. When Robin Williams, who was one of the great improvisational um, comedians of all times, improvised, he was doing it based on a series of routines that he knew very, very well. In a jazz orchestra, they don't just get up there and start making noise and hope it turns into music. They all know their instrument very, very well. They know certain um, passages of music. They know certain combinations of music. And then they just go with it in the moment. Executives do the same thing. Uh, I don't know if any of you, I've always marveled at, at executives that can get up in front of a group of anyone and make the perfect speech without notes. Have you, ever, have you ever met anyone like that? And you think, how did they just pull that out of their brain? Well, they didn't. They actually had all of that in there that they simply combined and recombined, responding to the audience as, as the speech occurred. So. In order to improvise, you first have to build a repertoire. You need to know your stuff. You need to um, practice responding to different things in different ways. Don't always respond the same way to everything. And don't rely too much on one single song. Um, we, t we talk a lot about messaging and making sure that you get your message across. Well, mix up your message a little bit. Make sure that you have more than one message so that you can, you can resonate with who you're talking with at the time. And then there's the control issue. Um, if you're going to allow for improvisation, if you're going to allow for improvisation, you have to do things in new ways. And in order for that to occur, you have to loosen controls. You can't choreograph an improvisation. You can't choreograph a problem that has not occurred yet. No, nor can you over control on a day to day basis because it makes people incapable of responding when you cut the cord. So if you just all go into your organizations, if you have fairly controlled organ organizations, and you just go back and say, uh, I went to a presentation and said I'm supposed to loosen controls, what's going to happen? It's not going to be good. 
right? Because people have no practice. They don't know what to do. So um, you need to loosen controls a couple of different ways. One is rather than focusing on consistency and control, trying to do this, the, the, the same thing the same way every time, what you want to do is be more like an emergency medical team. They are all experts in what they do. There are many, many routines. There's a lot of repertoires that are built into an emergency medical response. But they don't follow a blueprint. When the patient presents in a way that is unanticipated, they combine and recombine those routines to take care of the patient. So they're not rigid about first we do this, second we do this, third we do this. You know, you, the ABCs, what is it, airway, breathing, and cardiac, something like that, ABCs. Somebody knows that. Anyway, um, if, the, if the patient presents with E um, and is bleeding all over the table, you're not going to be saying, oh, we haven't done the airway yet. Uh, you respond to what's happening at the time, in the moment, but you have all of these repertoires. You have this expertise that you can draw on. So when problems arise and situations shape up in unexpected ways, you depart from the routine and you experiment, you improvise. Loosening control also means that everyone's on deck. Um, when all hands are on deck on a boat, that means that everyone comes up to the deck and does their job. And there's no one person um, saying, you do this now and you do this now. They all know their jobs and they all do it. And the same thing is true in human organizations. You can't control and, and choreograph everything that's going to happen if you want this sort of resilient response, if you want this sort of improvisation. And again, what qualities are we seeking to foster? What we're trying to do is we're actually trying to create organizations that are redundant. And you may be saying to yourself, what is that woman saying she knows nothing about government service? We don't do redundancy, right? Well, in fact, if you think of an airplane, an airplane has redundant systems. It has to. And it isn't a matter of duplicating. It simply means that more than one person knows how to do stuff. That, that Paul knows what Susan's doing, and so if, if Susan gets in, it has to be away from work, and then something horrible befalls the organization, people can make up and, and take over for each other because they understand what the other functions are, and although they may not have the expertise that the other person does, at least they know, well, I know that we need to call so-and-so, I know we need to follow this procedure, I know we need to do this. Uh, the second thing is you're looking for a level of, of robust activity. Resilient organizations have a lot going on. Um, they are active, they're healthy, they're vigorous in the same way that a resilient human being is, is vigorous and active. An organization that is resilient is not just silent, doing the same thing the same way every day. They are flexible. Organizations that are resilient try new things, new ways, just because they can. Let's try it this way. Let's, let's you know, we're not, we're not beaten down. We're not burn out. We're not exhausted. Let's try this. Um, and I think probably most important, if you want people to take risks, they have to know it's OK to take risks. If you punish people for taking risks and failing, you're going to get exactly what you want. And that's no more risk, no more change, no more anything. Because people, when they are punished for trying new things, will not try them in the future. So you want to build trust and respect, knowing that it's OK to experiment in small ways and see what happens. So how does this fit with how we traditionally think about and manage organizations? really, really badly. And in fact, traditional management is largely antithetical to resilience. It will not get us there. It is exactly the wrong thing to do if you're trying to create an organization that's good at change. Because when you look at traditional management strategies, 
what you're trying to do is you're trying to control what happens. You're trying to ensure consistency. You want to avoid redundancy at all costs because it's inefficient, right? <laughs> Budget people don't like inefficiency. Um, you, you try to hold on to the information because that's a source of power. What f little information that you can now hold personally because most of it is available um, on the internet, but, but the, that, that the really juicy stuff you hold close, right? And no deviation. Do not deviate. We have to do things the way that we know we're supposed to do it. What's the policy? We're going to follow the policy, whether the situation is going to respond to the policy or not. Don't deviate. And we know better than that. And we're not stuck in the 1900s. We've learned over time, and it's become fairly well known, that people, um, people need to be valued. People need to be involved. Um, we also know that organizations cannot be built the one best way and never change. We, we know that intellectually. But what happens when it hits the fan? What happens when the unexpected hit? What do we do? We hang on for dear life, right? When things are flying out of control, what do we want to do? Exert control. And there's actually a really, really good reason for this. Psychologically, we are trying to survive. And when we're threatened, when things are getting out of control, that's the most stress that a human being can be under, is to feel like they have no control. What you do, that survival instinct kicks in, and you revert to this clamping down control. I need to get control of this chaos. We centralize information. We buckle down. We enforce rules and we revert to this sort of bureaucratic thinking about control and consistency and no deviation and no, keeping the information centralized and decentralizing the decision making. But it's a human response. It's, it, there's good reason that we do it. And the only way to stop doing this is to practice responding differently with smaller things. You have to practice this over time because then when the, when the big problem hits, when the big challenge hits, you're already used to doing this. You take a deep breath and you say, I trust my people. I know that they can do this because they've done it over and over and over again. And I can trust myself that, it's, that I, I'm going to be able to handle this. If you don't do that, and if you revert to the sort of bureaucratic control uh, and psychological survival response, that's what happens. The organization becomes brittle, inflexible, and the people in it burn out. It's like that rubber ball that you threw against the wall one too many times. And it just kind of splats. Um, and you've all seen organizations like this that have just been through too much. And to try to change those organizations is next to impossible because it's, they become almost frozen because they have been beaten and beaten and beaten against the wall as if they are engineered to do so, and they're not. So what do we do about it? If traditional leadership approaches don't work, then what perspectives can we use to build resilience? Um, is there some sort of magic we can, we can use? It's not magic, but it takes conscious effort. And there are three major levers. One is organizational culture. Edgar Schein said that organizational culture is like an iceberg, um, in that most of what you see in an organization is above the water. But underneath where you can see, there are all kinds of unwritten rules and rituals and meanings and values that dictate almost the personality of the organization, that people who come into the organization are socialized into. And, and people in an organization have their own language. How many of you have ever gone to an organization and they alphabet soup you? 
it's you know the, well the, we're going to do the RPD and the six by five and have you have you filed the five zero five two? No. Um, so organizations are socially constructed. They have language. They have customs. They have rituals. They have norms. They have unwritten rules. And culture, just like personality, shifts very, very slowly. But it's one of the levers that leaders can use to shape behavior in organizations. And it's one of the best levers. Interestingly, one of the primary ways that organizational culture is transmitted to the people in an organization is through storytelling. And what is the most common story is to talk about when the boss showed her true colors, right? How the boss responded in a time of crisis. Because what that communicates to the organization is this, the, this is what we really value around here. This is the way this organization really is. So that moment at which you decide how to respond is crucial not only in building um, trust and cooperation and the capacity to adapt in the future, it becomes a part of the organizational culture. It becomes part of the folklore. And so people believe that that, that is who you are. And that, if we, if we can talk about how you respond in a time of crisis, that's what really matters. And that story will be repeated over and over and over and over again. So you have to be very careful. Um, there's a lot of ways to influence culture, but you want to build a culture where trying new things is okay, where we trust and respect each other, that we're all in this together, that we communicate, that we're committed to the larger organizational purpose, and all of those things that we've been talking about. The second thing that we can do is we need to change how we think about failure. Rather than hanging on for dear life, which will get you nowhere, sometimes you have to take a leap of faith. And that frog actually looks pretty darn scared. Um, it is scary. But the truth is that failure is the flip side of success. You cannot learn anything if you don't take a risk. And failing is actually fabulous because you learn what doesn't work. It's like physical exercise. You can't become strong without stressing your muscles, without stressing your heart, without stressing um, your lungs. You're not going to get stronger. So you want to invite in those stresses. Allow the organization to react in a way that's resilient, that will give people confidence about their ability to change, and take a leap and see what happens. We'll get back to that in a, in a minute. The flip side of this is to rethink safety. I'm a big fan of safety. I mean, truth be told, um, I don't like change. My name is Janet, and I don't like change. <laughs> um, but over time, I've had to really rethink what safety is. Safety is not staying the same. In fact, continuous safety is actually dangerous. Because safety is about having the capacity to deal with the things that you don't expect. To have the strength and the self-knowledge and the awareness of your values and the relationships and the communication and the commitment so that you know you can move forward. So you take small risks in order to build your capacity to handle the unknown. And you have to stop assuming that with enough planning, we're going to be OK. I was a planner early in my career. It did not work out. <laughs> Everything I planned for didn't happen, and a bunch of other stuff happened. So there you go. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can model personal resilience. Remember I said that resilience is not about a collection of resilient individuals. But as a leader and as a manager, you are going to be modeling the way. And I love this um, quote by Andrew Carnegie. There's little success where there is little laughter. Um, if you look at the work of the American Psychological Association, the Harvard Business Review, and many other sources, what they find is that resilient individuals don't go around saying, I'm really optimistic and confident. I know I can handle anything. 
They don't do that. What they do is they go around expressing com confidence and optimism in other people, in the people around them. You know, I like the way you handled that. I'm sure you can do this. I think it's going to turn out great. And by doing that, you look less like a jerk, which is always important in leadership, not looking like a jerk. Um, and you actually build your own confidence because the people around you are going to rise to the occasion. So you express confidence and optimism in situations, in other people, and it will come back to you. The second thing is that you take care of yourself. And you've all heard of this. You've gone to the stress management seminars. It's, it's true. You, you need to have relationships inside and outside of work. You need to take opportunities to learn, including learning about yourself. You need to relax, reflect, and laugh. I've worked, I, I, I wasn't always a professor, and I, I worked in a variety of agencies at a variety of different levels of government, everything from the prison system to um, the Office of the Secretary of Health and Human Services and a budget office. And what I found is that humor made organizations work, particularly in the prison. You know, you've all heard, heard of gallows humor. You have to keep your sense of humor. And if you look at resilient children, for example, they're the ones that had the sense of humor. And it's the same thing with adults. And then finally, this just is my shorthand, do what your mother said, eat, sleep, take your vitamins. You know, That all makes sense, keeping yourself in good shape. So what we're facing is really four challenges. Challenges in how we think, that we're not going to be able to predict the future. Challenges in how we plan. Planning isn't about trying to figure out what's going to happen. It's getting yourself ready for what might happen. And third, you go from being problem-driven to opportunity-driven. Because what do you do with a problem? You solve it. What do you do with an opportunity? You use it, right? So use challenges as a way to practice resilience and, and give people a good experience with change. Don't just solve the immediate problem. Because if you solve the immediate problem and you do it in a way that leaves people broken, they won't change the next time. So there is a form of management that we can talk about that's called adaptive management. Its origins are in ecology. And the idea is that natural systems are too complex and too unpredictable to rationally plan or to change wholesale. And so in adaptive management, you just kind of experience, experiment with things. You change a little, watch what happens, and change a little more. It also distinguishes between adaptive and maladaptive change. Just because you're changing a lot doesn't make you resilient. Just because you're changing a lot does not make you resilient. It may be making you more brittle. The, the, the idea is to change well. So you want to sort of experiment and watch what happens, play with new ideas, consider new ways of thinking. It's sort of like being a surfer, in a way. Would you ever draw up a blueprint for surfing? No. I'm going to answer for you. No, you wouldn't. Um, what you do when you surf is you make sure that you have the right equipment, and you go to the beach, and you get in the water, and you respond to what happens in the water. You respond to the waves as they present themselves to you. Um, you use good form, you enjoy the ride, and you keep practicing. That's not a bad management strategy, right? You show up. Rather than having a good surfboard, you have the right skills and the right equipment. After you show up, you're there. You be there. You be present. You respond to exactly what happens when it happens. You use good form, and you enjoy the ride. Not so different. And look si looking side by side, um, traditional management suggested that we rely on rational analysis, but using a management style that fosters resilience is going to have us focus not on what does the analysis say, but what matters here. Not my job is to control, my job is to do what we can plan for, 
and, and figure out the best way to do consistently. But in a lot of cases, we have to experiment and take risks. Rather than giving orders, you ask questions. Rather than punishing failure, you learn from failure. Not, man, you screwed up. It's, what did we learn from this? How can we change it differently in the future? Rather than being the boss, standing up at a podium with lights, I don't like this. Um, you want to be open and confident and humble because you need the people around you. You need them to be the best that they can be. And that means being open to them, being humble, recognizing that you need everyone. Um, and rather than focusing on maintaining order and obedience, what you want to do is engender trust and mutual respect. So the big message is challenges are an opportunity to build capacity. And adaptive management, all practiced over time, can enhance organizational resilience. And you can bounce back better. So here's the quiz. How many of you knew USC was in Sacramento? Good job. Um, USC has actually been in Sacramento for 40 years. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that we have a Master's of Public Administration program uh, that's ranked number six in the country, right here in Sacramento. You can do your whole agree, degree here in Sacramento, although you can take classes in LA if you want, and you can finish in two years while working full time. That's my plug. Now, any questions about resilience? Yes. You just want to look at it again? Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. I believe it will. Yes. Yes. Can you provide an example of uh, a good one for where you've seen an organization practice resiliency in a non crisis mode? I love that question because. The, the temptation to think, well, she's over there in that ivory tower. This is not possible. It actually is. Um, the, the organization that I've spent, is there a real organization that does this, or is this just in the minds of people who have nothing better to do? Um, <laughs> she didn't say that. I said that. Um, actually, the, the organization that I have found to be most resilient, that I have worked with very, very closely, is the city of Phoenix. Um, city of Phoenix was named uh, the best run city in the world a few years back along with um, Christchurch, New Zealand. And we spent a lot of time with them looking at their systems and looking what they did, studying their organizational culture. And that's where some of this original stuff came from. Um, they actually behaved this way. And it was really interesting. Um, there were a lot of ways to sort of observe it. At one point, the mayor um, said to a newspaper reporter, the newspaper reporter was saying, have you looked at this innovation that you're doing with sanitation? And the mayor said, no, we're an innovation machine. I can't possibly know all of the things we're trying. I trust them. That's a resilient response. Um, different organizations have, have more or less re resilience, and we're trying to always get more. Is there a perfect resilient organization? No. Is Phoenix as resilient as it used to be? No. But Leaders play a very, very important role in shaping the culture that it either allows for that response or not. It's sort of, it's an ideal. Anyone else? Thank you. <laughs>